Um, so Okay, so you have heard that as well. So welcome to this special online conversation hosted by Move Into The Future and the Wise Move Society, the online community for the over 50 generation. This generation is growing rapidly. They are living longer, are longer healthy and active and are better educated than ever. There are many reasons why this generation needs to be part of the workforce a lot longer than they expected when they started their careers. So we believe that the over 50 generation has a significant role to play in the creation of the future. We just need to tap into the knowledge, the experience and the wisdom. So with these Tuesday live conversations, we aim to give you a glimpse of what is happening online on the Wise Move Society, to share a bit about both the challenges and the opportunities that the 50 plus generation is facing, as well as how the members of the Wise Move Society work together to create the solutions and play an active role in society and the economy. So the 50 plus generation is very clear that they are not on their way out. They are able to reflect on what they have learned thus far in their lives and are part of the future. So for those who joined us on Zoom, welcome. We love you to contribute to the conversation. And if you want to do so, please show yourself on camera. And if you do not want to be seen, share your questions or comments in the chat. If you've joined us on Facebook, welcome everyone. Please share your feedback and questions in the comments. So my name is Ingun Boll. I'm the founder of Move Into The Future and the creator of the Wise Move Society. And I'm here today with my guest, Anamos Rogers and my co-host, Patty Washington. So Anne Moss is a speaker and certified suicide prevention teacher. She is the author of Emotionally Naked, A Guide to Suicide Prevention. And that, of course, is also the theme of today's conversation. So before we dive into that topic, I would like to give my co-host, Patty Washington, the chance to introduce herself. And Patty is one of the members of the Wise Moon Society and actually the one who initiated this topic. So Patty, can you give us some background information about yourself and why you think this is such an important topic looking at the Why Smooth Society target group, the 50 plus generation? Hello everybody, I'm Patty Washington, as Ingram has said, and I have been on the, I'm in Virginia in the United States, and I have been on the Suicide Prevention Coalition with Ann Moss here um, for about, I think about four years. I think I've been on it about four years and it really is an eye opener. And I think especially with the pandemic, the pandemic that we've had and everything like that, a lot of people are more isolated. And sometimes we feel like after you reach the age of 50 and stuff like that, sometimes you feel like, well, what what good am I anymore? And when you're isolated from everybody else, it's really hard to interact. And then you, a lot of times people do give up. So what we want to do today is, Ann Moss is a fabulous speaker and she has been really helping so many lives. She has saved so many lives around the world with her, her talks and her different things um, that she has done. So I thought that we'd bring this to the society today so we can get some ideas of some points of what to do. What do you do when you think somebody might be considering suicide? What are some of the nuts and bolts that we can maybe, because you might be the only person that's able to save that life. You might be the only one that sees that, you know, especially now that we are so isolated and we're just getting back into the community. So that's why I wanted to bring this here for us today. Thank you, uh, Patty. And uh, I knew this was uh, really a topic to your heart. And uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm really amazed by the work that you do. And, and of course, Anne Moss uh, is, is doing. So uh, let's dive uh, immediately into it. So while we also welcome Mary Jane. Hi, Mary Jane. Good to see you here. Um, Anne Moss, you know, when you write a book like that, 
emotionally naked, there must be a long story behind it. There is. In 2015, I owned a digital marketing firm and I thought, man, I have reached my dream of building my own company. And then my son killed himself. And overnight, I just lost all passion for what I was doing and became very focused on uh, suicide prevention and substance misuse or substance use disorder because my son also struggled with um, drugs and alcohol, mainly heroin. So I, I decided to start a blog called Emotionally Naked um, to find healing through writing and to shine a spotlight on all the taboo topics that no one wants to talk about a lot on mental health and suicide prevention. And then I wrote my first book, Diary of a Broken Mind, which is an award-winning memoir. And I included my son's lyrics in that book. My second book is very different. It is for um, the educational um, sector and it is uh, Emotionally Naked, a Teacher's Guide to Preventing Suicide and Recognizing Students at Risk. But a lot of the themes that are included in that book really are include all anybody that struggles with thoughts of suicide because we see a lot of similar themes. And I, I'm so, I'm just really impressed that you brought this topic today to light. And I think another thing we should talk about is those coping strategies and that isolation and what we've seen in middle age and really across uh, multiple ages is an increase in alcohol use. And I believe that's brought on, or we've seen statistics is brought on by the isolation. And that raises that suicide risk. So that, co that co unhealthy coping strategy seems to also raise the risk for suicide. So I don't think we can ignore that piece of it. Thank you. Yes. Um, wow, you know, I, I knew about, uh, you know, the reason why, but it's, it's always, you know, when you hear the story, it's, it is, uh, of course, very emotional and, 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 and really emotional reason why you start something like this. And I like what you see it say it's, it's about healing through writing because that it helps in so many situations. Yeah. Thank you for sharing and, and, uh, and opening up. Thank you very much. Um, when, when I was preparing this, this session, this conversation, I thought, well, you know, I have not seen anyone in my area, you know, with suicide. I have not experienced it, but I started writing down names who I knew that uh, had lost a brother, a mother, a, um, a friend, uh, a classmate, a son, a daughter, you know, there were, that list was amazingly long. If you, if you see it, what is happening. So, um, especially in a time like this with, uh, you know, the loneliness, and you mentioned the loneliness with the older generation, but also for the younger generation, there is so much going on with that generation as well. Um, what, what are the signals? Can you describe it? Have you seen what was happening? So, um... I think it's a gut feeling. So we have those general, uh, a notice of withdrawal, but I mean, that's kind of among everybody. So it's a little harder to see now. And I, I think reaching out and connecting with your friends and, and if you're seeing like a difference in sleeping patterns, an of increase in drinking, um, somebody's isolating more than ordin they ordinarily would, then you need to start to ask some questions. And a lot of times if a friend sort of ghosts on you, in other words, they isolate more, sometimes we take that personally and we say, 
oh, they don't want to be with me when in fact it's something they're going through. And we need to push through that doubt and start and be a little more thoughtfully nosy, I like to put it, and really kind of say, you know, I'm here to listen and don't give up. A lot of times, you know, when somebody doesn't show up to something, immediately we take it personally, like I said a minute ago, and we, we just need to ditch that and we need to start to look at the facts and, and go with our gut. Because if something isn't right with somebody, now they may not be in crisis and that's okay. And that's why we need to start to increase our connections however we can, because increasing connections is a, what we call a protective factor for preventing for suicide. And the more connections we have, the more belonging we feel, then the less likely that someone is to take their life. Now that doesn't mean they're not gonna have those feelings. It's just gonna mean that they're gonna feel like they're worthwhile and part of a, a larger picture. Patty, do you have anything to add? I think that's really, that's really true. And I think one thing that um, I learned and I learned a lot from being in the group is if you have that gut feeling and you think someone's suicide, ask them. That is not going to make, because we all, a lot of times I've heard in the past, and I thought this in the past too, well, I don't want to give them any ideas. You know, I don't want to mm -hmm. cause them to, for me to be their fault. You're not going to give them ideas. If they're, they're intelligent human beings, and if, if you're thinking that they might be thinking about it, the best thing you can do is ask them. Because a lot of times, a lot of different cases that um, we've been through with the Suicide Prevention Coalition and a lot of speakers that came in, um, they said, if just one person would have asked me, you know, if one person, we had one, uh, we had a gentleman, I can't remember his name, Ann, and Moss, I can't, uh, but jumped off the bridge, the uh, Ke Kevin, Golden Gate Kevin Bridge. Hines. Kevin yeah, Kevin Hines. Hines. And he said, when he was walking up there, he, he took like some buses and everything and he was crying and all this stuff and people just sort of made fun of him and he, then he was he was about ready to do it and he had this lady run up to him real quick. He's like, okay, this is my sign not to do it. She said, oh, will you just take a picture a selfie of me and walked off and he jumped off the bridge. Actually, he survived, but he really just wanted someone to, you have to ask. If you have your gut saying that, it's not, most of the time, they might be like, no, I'm not thinking about that. But at least you're getting the communication starting and you can, you don't know whose life you might be saving. Go with your gut. Mm -hmm. So I think what one time, lots of times we really don't want to ask the question, are you thinking of suicide? So you can frame that with observations you've made by saying that oftentimes people who are getting a divorce, let's say they're going through a divorce, sometimes they're thinking of suicide. Are you thinking of suicide? You have to be that direct. You do not say, are you thinking of harming yourself? You must say, are you thinking of suicide? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Because once we bring up the subject, we're saying we're not afraid of it. And I know in your heart, you're like, please say no. <laughs> or you, you feel that panic. Just know that anytime you ask that question, you are going to feel uncomfortable. You are going to feel that panic. Work through it. It's okay. That's what deep breaths are all about. Keep pushing through it. So you can frame it with something you've noticed. Uh, many times I've noticed when people get um, a, a really difficult diagnosis that you know could end their life, they're thinking of suicide. Are you thinking of suicide? Many times people who've lost a spouse or a child or a brother or sister are thinking of suicide. Are you thinking of suicide? So you can frame it and sometimes putting into it into context normalizes that conversation 
not only for yourself, but for the person you're talking to. Because it is really very common for somebody to struggle with thoughts of suicide. Mary Jane, did you mm -hmm. have a question? Yeah, and I, I just, you know, it made me think what you're sharing. Um, I mentioned to Patty earlier that I have a sister in West Virginia and she's been diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. And I was really, I was kind of shocked, but I was actually really pleased that the last visit, because I'm always on the call with her when she's at the oncologist and, and having treatment. And this time the, the questionnaire, they asked, they had a questionnaire and one of the thoughts, or one of the questions was, are you having suicidal thoughts? And I thought, wow, you know, um, this is one of the university hospitals it's in, in Cumberland, Maryland. And I thought, yeah, I mean, I felt, you know, she'd been withdrawing from us and, you know, all my sisters had felt she was withdrawing from us. She did, wasn't having them. She said, no, God, no. You know, I mean, she was really open and upfront. But I just want to say that maybe that also can be encouraged, you know, at that moment in time. And also, you asked the question by, by just having that conversation, you let your sister know if she ever was at that point that she could confide in you. And, you know, it could be that down the line, she might have reached that crisis point because I don't think any of us are immune to this. Mm -hmm. And I think that you've let her know that there, there is no subject off limits and that your love is unconditional. That really is beautiful, Mary Jane. I'm really- well, I didn't do that, Anne, but you're making me think that I will do that, you know? <laughs> we talk a couple of times a week and I'm gonna mention that, you know, that I've heard that question asked of her and just, I will do that, thank you, yeah, yeah. I let it go, you know, like again, the taboo it's uncomfortable. it's uncomfortable again you you, do, you really don't know i mean for a long time i did not ask i didn't know to ask my son but there was a time in my life where mm -hmm. i thought somebody was mm -hmm. thinking of it and i was afraid to ask mm -hmm. so that's a really really common thing but now we know and many studies have proven that if we ask it encourages people with those thoughts to start to talk about it and ask for help. <clears throat> the difference is a lot of people who are exposed to suicide, it does raise their risk. All of a sudden, it seems to run in families or oftentimes that they're exposed to it, it, it sort of becomes part of their toolbox of coping. And so we need to recognize that you know, within families, it can, it can run in families mm -hmm. and, and to be, you know, aware of that. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is it an emotional state or is it a physical state, chemical state? I think they have described it as a little bit of both. So it's kind of like, let's say you're standing in a house and the house is on fire. And right next to you is a bucket of water and you're on fire. So you grab that bucket of water because all of a sudden you're in pain and you pour that bucket of water on yourself to stop those flames. That can be like suicide. And it's, it's this moment of an emotional moment that someone is really driven to in a moment of extreme pain, which could be physical and emotional at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we, we think of it often as that they're choosing, like life has gotten so bad, they've made this choice and that's not really the case. It's almost like when people go into battle, uh, men have described, and women, when they go to war and there's this tunnel vision and and it's kind of like that. It's, it's this emotional departure from reality. And when I've talked to people who are currently in a suicidal crisis, they're sort of in a trance. And oftentimes it has a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. So let's say 20 minutes. So there was a young lady I was talking to and she was on a bridge. 
And she, it, you know, it was 20 degrees out. She had no coat on, no gloves, no nothing. And I kept asking her, do you feel cold? And she was like, no, I don't. So we just talked. So we don't want to say things like, oh, you have so much to live for because they're not in that frame of mind at the moment. What you want to do is you want to listen with compassion and say, tell me more. How long have you felt this way? And really just listen. And you will kind of feel helpless, like I can't fix this. And in this situation, calling 911 wasn't an option because she was calling me from a bridge and we have, you know, we have 25, 30 bridges around here. I had no idea which one she was, she was at. So I just had to stay with her and ask questions. And I could tell when she was getting out of it because all of a sudden she says, it's really cold out here. And I was like, ah. Oh. And that's when I said, oh man, I bet your car is really warm and you could like cut it on and heat up and get out of the cold because it's gotta be windy there. And so she got in the car and she was still having those thoughts, but she was in the car, not standing on the side. And I had to just kind of talk her through. And my only choice was to get her to drive back home. Mm -hmm. and I was able to call her once she got home and I was able to call her the next day to check in. And she felt embarrassed and ashamed. And I said, no, I'm honored, honored you called me because that means that you trust me as a human being and that you knew that, that I wasn't going to pass judgment. Ooh. All of that is really important. Mm -hmm. If you look it up, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, carry on. It's okay, Francis. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I'm asking that question is that I went through a period where I did think of suicide. Afterwards, when I, when I saw a therapist, she told me that I was experiencing the same symptoms as PTSD. Um, sometimes you, life gives you so many knocks that you go into the same state that veterans from war, from, from very um, dangerous war zone, the things they've seen, you have exactly the same symptoms. And that feeling of hopelessness, that there's, there's no point. There's just no point, no matter what happens, no matter who helps, there's no point to carry on. And it's that PTSD that you have to deal with before you can um, become healthy again. I love what you said there, Francis, because what you just pointed out was that nobody suicides for one reason. Mm -hmm. So earlier when I was talking about divorce, that's just one contributing factor. And nobody suicides because they were bullied or because they're getting a divorce. It is because they've gotten a diagnosis. Um, their mother's living with them and has Alzheimer's. Uh, they have a physical illness, they have an underlying mental illness or trauma. I mean, somebody has to be in a vulnerable state of mind. And that can come on from multiple factors. Now, most people who have thoughts of suicide have been exposed to some type of trauma or some type of mental illness. And I can name probably 10 reasons that my own son was struggling with thoughts of suicide and ended his life. And it took me a long time to get there. Drug addiction was part of it. Depression, he had a sleep disorder. Um, he was uh, sexually assaulted by a policeman and that trial was coming up where they accused him of, um, what was it? Uh, assault on an officer. Uh. And he was handcuffed. I'm like, how do you assault an officer when you're 130 pounds, six foot two, and you're handcuffed? And, you know, he was like, he felt like the, the deck was stacked against him. And that's just a few of the reasons. Mm -hmm. So I love that you pointed out that there were multiple things in your life that weren't going at one time, and it put you in this PTSD. PTSD sort of state of mind. 
that's an excellent description. So thank you really for sharing that and for being so open. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I'm, my question was was a bit similar. You know, it is not a a moment that you make that choice. It is a whole process. It is it is. It might be years. It might be months. It might be that that people move into this direction. And if you look at, for instance, the generation that we're talking about, you know, the fifty plus you hear more and more that there's a lot of loneliness, loneliness, there's a lot of depression, there is, you know, so many things going on. And also in that age group, you know, you can, uh, especially, you know, losing your job, losing your business, maybe going through a di divorce, your kids have left the house, uh, you know, there's, you have to take care of your parents and they might be, you know, they might be going on a lot of things. And, uh, and then it, and it, it, you know, it just happens. It, it is this whole life, what, what adds up to this moment that you feel like, you know, I can't handle it anymore and I have to do everything on my own. So um, if you look at this, this, how can you recognize this? How can you just, you don't want to be at that point that you feel like, yes, now they're going to do it. You want to be somewhere on the way already that, that you can support them or that you can be there for them. I think that in terms of for yourself, um, if you're feeling that way, the number one thing to do is increase your connections. You know, if you love to hike, join a hiking group. If you love to do art, join an art group. Join the Wise News Society. You know, problem, get that. Uh, yeah. The problem with that is that's the one thing you don't want to do. It is. You want to isolate. And that's why we, we call it problem. something called opposite action. And when somebody is so far down, lots of times they can't do it. And it takes a friend to just say, I'm here with you. Let's just go out for a walk. Mm -hmm. Let's go, go out for lunch. Let's, you know, go out and have coffee. Just one simple, yeah, you know, I've had people say a hug saved my life. I was thinking of suicide and somebody gave me a hug. I have heard people say, I was contemplating suicide and somebody sent me a text. It, it really can be very simple, but to start to increase those connections and that sense of purpose. So none of, a lot of us aren't at that point right now. So let's concentrate on developing that sense of purpose, you know, that new thing that we want to kind of cultivate that so, social justice cause that's important to us, giving back, giving back always helps, you know, whether it's a homeless shelter, serving food, um, helping people who are addicted to, to substances in anything, helping dogs, you know, if, mm -hmm. if that helps. Lots of times an animal will prevent somebody from suiciding. And recognize those coping strategies that work for you. What works for me is writing, making sure I have my connections, um, speaking, and, and be in parts of groups like this. And that's my kind of giving back and that has helped me heal. Um, and expanding my sense of purpose, never losing sight of what it is I wanna do, having goals, not just goals, but that, that feeling that, that mm -hmm. I'm making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I wake up some days and I feel like, gosh, I'm really not. And I'm like, no, let me pull out my book of wins and let me look through all the comments people have sent me over the years. And I've talked to tens of thousands who've been struggling with thoughts of suicide and have some lovely comments. And sometimes I just pull out that book and I look at it and it's like, okay, you know, I'm in a good place now. Or I go out and I exercise. So it's really about building your own toolbox of so those coping strategies that work for you and figuring out the, what's healthy, 
and what is unhealthy. I mean, to me, uh, drinking and using a substance to work through grief was going to leave me stuck in that early, awful, raw state where it was so painful. I, I thought I'd be in the fetal position at the bottom of my shower forever. Mm -hmm. And so how did I get out of bed in the morning and go running? So one of the things I did was when the alarm went off, I said, all I have to do is sit up and put my feet on the floor. You know, I didn't think, you know, oh, I have to go do all this. I just cut it down. I have to put my feet on the floor. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go brush my teeth. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put on my running shoes. I'm going to put on my clothes. And I'm going to go outside. And if I don't feel like running, I won't. But once I was outside, I usually did. Well, I'm already outside. I might as well go. And my legs felt like lead. I felt like lead. I ran like a dead chicken. I mean, you know, I wasn't going for the Olympics. And then I would cry. My eyelashes would freeze. But about halfway into it, I would feel a sense of peace and a sense of rhythm. So we can't fix this pain but we can learn to manage it and we can minimize our suffering. So it's looking and finding ways. So what I did when I put my feet to the floor is something called opposite action. I wanted to go back to bed. I wanted to go sleep because when I was asleep, Charles was in my dreams and he was alive and he was beautiful with his gorgeous curly hair and he was giving me hugs. And when I was awake, I was the mother of a child who died by suicide. And I had to, to make exercise opposite action, do the opposite of going back to bed. Because I knew that other was just going to make me feel worse all day. I mean, then I'd just wallow in my own pain all day long. Now it was painful all day and I would have episodes. But Feelings, really intense feelings last 60 to 90 seconds. <clears throat> we can all make it through 60 to 90 seconds. Nothing is continuous. Everything is always changing. And we can be the driver to that change. If we're not seeing anything beautiful in our lives, we have to force ourselves to go look at something beautiful every day. I, like that bridge behind me, that was one of the things I went and I went to go look at it every single day because I love that view and it gave me a feeling of peace. And at a time where I saw nothing positive, I had to make myself go find things that were positive so that my mind would start to see them again because it was filtering all that out. It was a journey and it wasn't fast and it wasn't pretty and it was extremely painful, but it was worth it. Because the people I met along the way and the lives that I saved that I didn't even know I was saving because I was speaking my heart and I was being emotionally naked, that started to just bring me such joy and it it filled my heart and I could see that reason for living and I started to develop a purpose and the purpose you have today if you can't see anything make one little small purpose you know just little tiny I'm gonna call this friend that can be your purpose you know until you you know you build a grander scheme it doesn't have to be I'm going to save the world. It can be, I'm going to do this one thing. And then you build from there. So my purpose has shifted and changed. And now it's more developed, but it, it's taken six years to get there. And when I got frustrated, you know, what am I going to do with my life? I had to say, you know what, be patient. That big picture will come to me. 
but for right now, I want to do this and I'm doing it well and I feel good about it. And then I will move on to the next thing when, when it's the right time and I'll know the right time. Mm-hmm. So have some trust in yourself. Mm-hmm. Has there somewhere on the way, somewhere in all these six years been this moment that you felt like, I am going to kill myself? Fortunately, I have never had that feeling, which is extremely rare. And it's really rare for parents who've lost a child to suicide. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to give you a little bit of background. When I was 15, I dove into the water and I broke my neck. And I spent uh, nine months in a neck brace. And I mean, I'm really lucky to be alive and I'm really lucky not to be paralyzed. The next thing that happened to me was that I was attacked at knife point and barely escaped rape and murder. Um, I decided to fight back. It was risking my life to do so, but I, obviously uh, it happened uh, the, the good way. I had actually listened to a um, Phil Donahue show, which was a show from the 70s. And a woman was on there and said, if you're ever attacked, Uh, for the purpose of rape, here are your choices and here's what to do. And I remembered that show that night. In 1999, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor and uh, I had two brain surgeries and I died on the table during a diagnostic during one of those tests. I was struck by lightning when I was 18 and worked at a, a camp and then when my son died by suicide, it was kind of like I had all this experience of, of resilience building activities. Mm-hmm. So your, your, all that pain has a purpose and it builds up your reserve in your toolbox. And the hardest part for me after the brain surgeries was I was going to the doctors, all this stuff was happening. And then I, you know, they cleared me and then nobody was there. And it was like, I had no direction to go in. That was the most difficult part for me. So I already had this, you know, I decided to exercise more. I decided to write more. So I already had developed something of a toolbox by the time my son took his life. And that you know, so if you've had adverse experiences before, you've built the resilience and just know that you can pull through it. I mean, that's a legitimate question. And I'd say about one third of all parents who lose a child to any cause of death do struggle with thoughts of suicide and grieving people in general are at higher risk as well. Because once you lose someone you love, there is that thought, I want to go join them. And we need to start to develop that reason why we need to stay here. And sometimes the reason is that I feel obligated to live until you can feel like you want to live again and trust that you will again. Because that's that's a big part of it is just telling yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part with our society at the over 50 society, because a lot of us have experienced a lot of loss. Sometimes we've lost our children. We have lost, um, you know, family members. You know, we're, we're at the age now where we're going to more funerals than we are going to weddings sometimes, you know. So, um, and then if you, and then if you lose your job on top of that, your purpose, so what is your purpose? That's why it's so important to have functions like this. And and this is why we, I think this is why Ingham did this move and have this. So we can reach out like you, like you were saying, Amos, you have to reach out to each other. You have to find some type of purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's so important at our age to really, really understand that you still have a purpose. You Mm -hmm. still have a lot more years and a lot more to give. Mm 
Even if you can't move around as much, maybe you can't go out running, but you could still do other things. Meet on Zoom, a phone call, anything like that, you know, really, and have these deep conversations, not just, hi, how are you? How's the weather? You know, really talk to somebody when you're talking to them and really listen to what they have to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think listening is a really underrated skill because many times we want to fix the situation. And when what we really need to do is, is just ask more questions. And I, I always, I always tell parents, you know, listen more and lecture less. And it's such a simple thing to offer another human being, but you're giving another human being your time and you're giving them your full attention. And that is really worth something to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I've found that even if you have like a child who struggles with substance use disorder or mental illness, we tend to talk right over them knowing what's coming. However, if you kind of reflect back what they're saying, they're like, oh my gosh, you heard me. And they've said it a hundred times, but until you, acknowledge what has been said, oftentimes people don't feel heard. And I, I think that is just so important. And Francis mentioned the loss of meaning or, or purpose is not easy to overcome. None of this is. And that's why, you know, being a part of the society is that first step. You're making that connection into something, something different you know, creating new relationships. And that's where you start to develop that purpose. So it's doing things, it's being curious about something in your life or something's touched your life and you wanna do something about it. And it, you know, you don't go out and say, mm, well, today I'm gonna go find a purpose and it's just gonna dawn on me and it's gonna happen in one day. Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't, like I said, it took me years. I knew I wanted to write a book. And then the second book, the publisher called me and here my life went in this completely different direction. I mean, I was speaking at schools, but you know, it was, it let the, sometimes you can let the universe guide you, mm -hmm. but you have to do some work on your own. Nobody, nobody can save somebody else but you can help someone at, someone save their own life. And that's what you're looking to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But as Francis is saying, I was lucky I got a grandson and a brand new world opened up for me. Yeah, There's those things as well, you know, really being involved with those small things in life that, uh, that absolutely helps. Yeah, preparing this, this conversation, I was just looking up the... Um, uh, the numbers of suicide here in the Netherlands. And of course, we're a small country. Uh, and especially last year's uh, numbers, because um, of course, last year we had a lot of um, information news that the number of uh, suicides went up because of COVID. And especially the numbers of COVID went down and suicide went up. But on the other hand, if you uh, if I compare to the numbers last year to uh, to the years before, it was not so much up, but it was also the age group that was different, and uh, especially the the forty, but but mostly sixty plus, eighty plus suicide in that age group was really high up. Yeah, so I do think that what you're saying is. Um, uh, reaching out, listening, uh, you know, if you see that people are lonely. And it can be small things like, for instance, what we did, did last year when uh, COVID started in, in March. Uh, we created this, you know, here on, on the, in our own street, you know, we had all our WhatsApp numbers and we really emphasized that if there is some, something wrong of, or we feel that people are really getting lonely, that they had this group and say, okay, I really need support right now. Because that is also, um, maybe they, they don't do it, but there have been moments that, uh, that people just um, 
just ask for you know someone to talk to and that at a at a time like that is already it can be enough but we have to be aware especially in our own little circle and it is right now what is happening with people uh, are they okay are they uh, always on their own or are they seeing others and and are they in touch and and um reach out and i love what you're saying you know just by listening not talking and i saw one of the comments with francis another book or another uh, advice you know that's you know you don't need that at that moment you need that someone just listens to you and and hears your story can i ask another question what do you what is your view on euthanasia so euthanasia to me is completely different from suicide and I wish that once somebody, let's say my dad was in his 90s and really the last year he was in bed just existing and costing a lot of money. And I don't think he wanted to be in that state. And I wish he would have had that choice at that point. It, like a lot of people talk about a physician assisted suicide and thank you for saying euthanasia instead because Suicide is a lone act, and mm. that is a whole different medical decision, and it really is a, kind of a whole different branch of, you know, looking at a very difficult question, you know, uh, how do you figure all that out? But, you know, I was looking at my dog in January who was, you know, we got the vet to come over to put him in sleep, but I remember an hour before she got there, he got on the floor and was looking up at my husband like, I am done. And I remember walking into the room going, the look on that dog's face looks like it's I'm done. And he said, I was thinking the same thing. Dog didn't move. He's like, I'm done. And we, we don't offer our humans that same opportunity. Unless you go to Switzerland. Yeah, that's true. It, it, is, it is there. But in the United States, I we're a long way from from that subject. I mean, we can't we can't even yeah, battle. You know, we're a big big country, and that makes that makes things a lot more challenging. Here in the Netherlands, it is allowed, but it's a whole process, and and we've uh, actually experienced it with my sister in law. She was uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease disease at a very early age. And um, at the beginning of this year, you know, there are the, all these rules and she was afraid that she wasn't able to decide on her own anymore. You know, it was getting worse and worse. Uh, so at the beginning of this year, she decided and again with her family, with her children. And it was actually what you mentioned. It was, it was a beautiful ceremony uh and everyone was happy you know she was happy her kids were happy and of course there is the thought when you're 65 you feel like you should have lived another 30 years maybe you know that is but it wasn't you know she had been sick already for uh, for quite some years and she lost more and more of herself on the way and uh so it actually it was it was a great ceremony and we were we were all happy that she could make that decision still on her own if she had lost that moment she might have lived another 30 years in a state of nothingness and that would really have been terrible yeah so um I, we really have to watch the time because i really Oh gosh, I think we can talk for hours on this subject. And, you know, because mental health is an issue. No, you know, mental health is the, uh, the next worldwide pandemic. I really believe that what is going on right now, depression, how many people are medication? And we feel like there's people that don't want to take the, uh, the vaccination, but how many people are on antidepressants? That is, that's, 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 well, again, well, that's that's the numbers, and, and it's so it's hard. okay to be on an antidepressant if that's working it for helps you. you. Yes, it yeah. is, but it is also a sign that there is something going on in the world, and that we need to reach out to each and every one. So you know, open up your your homes, open up your mind, open up your you know your ear for everything that is 
happening and and uh, uh, because people people need you and uh, and that's very important. I heard you say really fantastic things and especially on um, you know for for people who are in that in that position that they need to reach out to others to be aware of what is going on and to give you know to give that call and and you know do the things the small things that you can do to uh, to support people and to uh, maybe prevent it from happening uh, that's good but also loved your uh, your um, the things that you mentioned that you can do yourself uh, and again that is not easy you you probably need your support group and that is uh, you know, I, I heard that and, and increase your connections, you know, find your, we always say, find your tribe, you really need a new support system and uh, reach out to people. Um, that opposite action, really great. And I think we need to do something about it. That's, I'm already thinking, what can we do on our, uh, on the Wise Move Society to, uh, to work on that, but all the, the, uh, the training and workshops that we are doing, because I do think that's, uh, uh, that can really add giving back. I love that one too. You know, it is right. You know, to really work on something, a project, or that you feel needed again, that you don't feel useless and and maybe a failure, but that you really feel needed again. And uh, uh, and also, if you have that in that purpose and want to create that impact, that that is your next step. There is. I always mention there is so much to do and good things, especially in this, in this age group also, we are looking more for uh, really purpose, really that, that creating that impact. It's not only more about money and power and things like that. It is really about making a difference. Uh, so I really think that is a, a good exercise. You know, it's good for your physical health. It's good for your mental health. Uh, and it is way, and it is step by step. I can imagine when you're too depressed or too tired to get out of your bed that already getting up but, and doing the, the first steps and making it longer every day. But ask someone to join you and, and uh, really take those, you know, to go for those walks. You don't have to start with the gym and do all kinds of difficult exercises, but just go into nature also very important, you know, to connect with nature, to connect to where you come from, to connect with, you know, to really ground, be conscious of what is going on. <clears throat> you know, there's, there's, there is a lot of things that might help. I really do agree. But if you are in that situation, it might take you six years. It might take you long, but at least if there's, you know, during those six years that there are people, you know, walking, the journey with you and even if it's a small part that you feel like okay yes i feel that connection i feel needed again i feel useful again i feel my purpose again and things like that that re really might uh, might add or add up to uh, to everything mary jane yeah um and and you have a double name like i do i take it and moss yeah. yeah okay i do okay um so um a friend of mine i didn't know her at the time <clears throat> but uh Previous to my getting to know her, she'd had a burnout. And she'd shared a lot about her burnout with me, um, what she experienced, et cetera. But it was later that she mentioned that she had actually had suicidal thoughts. She was in such a black hole during this burnout. And I'm, I'm just curious because I deal a lot uh, with potential burnout uh, in my clients. <clears throat> and many of them have had burnouts. But is, can, are there any statistics on this one point? Um, do people who cons are considered in a burnout, and I, and I think that can take many different shapes and forms, but have you any experience or knowledge on the percentages or the risks for suicide in this group? I don't, but I can <laughs> tell you that people who are at that point that burnout would probably be a big risk factor. And I agree with that. And sometimes people are in a state where they need you to help them. Because a friend of mine said that she locked herself in the apartment and she was starving herself to death. And her aunt had to go get the superintendent to open the door and get her help. And she was willing to do that. So sometimes people are in such a state that they need you to say, 
come and get in the car. We're going to the, in the uh, United mm -hmm. States, you go to the emergency room. We need to get you help right now mm -hmm. because they're unable to help themselves at that mm -hmm. point. And we have to recognize that, but many burnout can be early in burnout and can be later in burnout, but that is a huge problem and a huge trigger. And I'm glad you brought it up, Mary Jane, because we've seen that a lot in healthcare here uh, during COVID is that there was a doctor who took her life from Virginia uh, right in the middle of COVID, you know, in the worst of the pandemic, because she was just, you know, no sleep and seeing people die over and over. And she just felt useless and worthless. And, you know, it, she was struggling with burnout. Mm -hmm. And it is a huge problem. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would like to add one yes. uh, one thing. I just want to add to because of this topic, we we talked about you know to ask somebody, but what happens if they say yes, I'm suicidal? So I would just like to put some just some little nuts and bolts that I have learned on the way. The one thing you want to do if they tell you that they're suicidal, ask them if they have a plan. Ask them if they have, if they have, you know, how, how do you plan on doing this? You have to have this conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Ask them if they have a plan. Do they have, like, if they said they're going to take pills, do they have the pills there? Then I would also recommend that not, not only have them call someone, but call with them. Like you call 911 or, you know, I don't know what your crisis is in other countries is if you have a certain number you can call for an emergency mm -hmm. stay with them mm -hmm. tell them Partners that you will show. be with them. yeah the part you want to be with them through it you know you you, right. you can't you know you you just you have that's so important to be there with them so I just wanted to give that little nuts and bolts there too to give you something in case you do run into this mm -hmm. yeah absolutely Thank you for that, uh, Betty. Is there anything that else that you want to add? Because we really have to wrap up. Um, but it was your topic. Did it, it, is this what you wanted to get out of it? Hmm. Good. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ann Moss. You're always fabulous. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. For, thank you for your contribution. What we will do is um, uh, make a link to your book um you know on in the comments of the uh, the live stream so that people know where to find your book and i saw that there was another one uh, any recommend recommendations for now because there are people watching you know and there might be this one thinking okay i really need to reach out i need this is my moment you know what who, 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 you, this is hard because of course we're in an international community who can people call? Is it is is it nine one one? No, it's their friends. Call a friend, or what? What is the best way? If you really feel like this is, I am at that moment that I really want to commit suicide. Um, you know, call a hotline. You call can a call hotline. a hotline. They're twenty four seven, and most every country has one. And I yes. have a link to all international um and i see in my statistics that people go to a particular page and they click on all international hotlines okay so i have the main ones but so if you can uh, mention that as well because i do believe you know we might have opened up something for uh, uh for someone who is listening yeah Please give us that thing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all who, uh, you know, are our speakers. Uh, and, and must thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you, Patty, for uh, bringing up this topic. Thank you, Frances, Mary Jane, and what was it, Laurie? Larry, that you joined us? Larry. Larry, thank yes. you very much for joining us. Um, well, thank you. Know, you. This, yeah, this was a glimpse of what we're doing at the Wise Move Society. And it was, you know, there were several moments that we said, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. Uh, this actually is part of what we're doing. You know, we want to get that 50 plus 
generation on their feet. We want them to be part of it. We want them to find their purpose, find that new network, that group of people that is their support system. There's so much going on there. Uh, and if you join us this month, in the month of August, you get two months extra on your yearly um, uh, membership. So uh, make sure you join us. Also, that link will be in the comments of uh, um, of this, uh, uh, the recordings or uh, this Facebook Live. So uh, we're looking forward to see you there. Thank you all and have a Thank wonderful Thank you, Aiden. Thanks, everybody. And Moss, thank you. everybody. Good seeing you, Ann. Oh, good seeing you, Larry and Mary Jane and Francis and Patty. Thank you, and Ingo. <laughs> thank you all so 